Breaking tonight, a new executive order on immigration could come down at any moment. Plus, President Trump's search for a new national security advisor is over. It is day 32 of the first 100. I'm Sandra Smith in for Martha McCallum. Just a short time ago from his Mar-a-Lago resort, President Trump announcing Lieutenant General H.R. McMaster will take over as national security advisor. The announcement coming exactly one week after Michael Flynn resigned the position. Plus, today we learned that President Trump is expected to double down on his immigration ban and sign a new executive order within days. That order will still target the same seven countries, Iran, Iraq, Syria, Somalia, Yemen, Sudan, and Libya. As the president molds that new order, he is taking some heat for defending a ban on refugees by citing a non-existent attack in Sweden. But some say the president was not entirely wrong. Matt Bennett, Dana Lash and Guy Benson are all here on that in just moments. But first, let's go to Chief White House Correspondent John Roberts on the looming immigration rewrite. John. Sandra, good evening to you. I'm told by White House officials that it will probably be toward the end of the week, maybe Thursday or Friday, that we see this new executive order on what's called extreme vetting, but it also includes that immigration ban. You ran over the seven countries there just a second ago, so no reason to do it again. But the White House hopes that this one is going to pass legal muster, unlike the last one, which has gotten mired up in the courts, because it's going to create special carve-outs for certain individuals, people like legal permanent residents who got trapped in the first one, also people already here on certain visas, like work visas or student visas, and foreign nationals who have been helping the United States in the fight against terror. And the White House Counsel's Office at the same time is poised to hand new powers to the Department of Homeland Security to crack down on illegal immigration, particularly across our southern border. They're in the process of approving implementation memos from Secretary John Kelly that were signed on Friday. Those would include provisions like hiring 10,000 additional ICE agents, hiring 5,000 more Border Patrol agents. These are things that the, the president talked about at length during the election campaign. And it would also prioritize the removal of criminal illegal aliens, people who have been convicted of any type of criminal offense, people who have been charged with a criminal offense that has not been resolved, people who have abused public benefit programs. That's an interesting little twist here that may end up uh, getting a lot of opposition. And people who are subject to a removal order but are still in the country. It would also expand to some degree what's known as the 287G program and that allows the federal government to sort of work in partnership, almost deputize local law enforcement to aid in immigration enforcement and deportations. Now this does not include though National Guard troops. That was an erroneous story that was out there on Friday. This has nothing to do with the National Guard at all, just local law enforcement. And the president starting off this week on a strong footing, announcing that after having a weekend of job interviews, he has a new national security advisor. Here he is, H.R. McMaster, lieutenant general in the U.S. Army. And he is going to maintain that rank, by the way, when he is, uh, serves as a national security advisor. He's highly respected decorated career officer. And what's really interesting too, Sandra, about all of this is he is the head of the Army Ca uh, Capabilities Integration Center, which means that basically he's a futurist. He looks ahead to the threats that will be facing the United States and our ability to respond to them, which I think would really give him a good background to be a national security advisor. Sandra? All right, John Roberts, thank you for that report. Good to see you. And as we await a new executive order on immigration, it is a comment about some of those very refugees the president made this weekend that has stirred some new outrage. On Friday, Tucker Carlson tonight ran an interview with filmmaker Ami Horowitz about the alleged crime spike in Sweden after the nation took in hundreds of thousands of refugees over just the past few years. They know that this, this crime is happening, they can feel it, the statistics are clear, but they would refer to what is the root cause behind it and say, oh, it's just more, it happens to be more violence, it's men who are raping people, not the refugees, they'll make excuses for it. The majority of the population in Sweden still want to have an open door policy, it's really, it's confounding. On Saturday at his rally in Melbourne, Florida, President Trump referenced the reporting. Watch. You look at what's happening last night in Sweden. Sweden, who would believe this? Sweden, they took in large numbers. They're having problems like they never thought possible. 
Then on Sunday, the president clarified the meaning behind his statement, tweeting this. My statement as to what's happening in Sweden was in reference to a story that was broadcast on Fox News concerning immigrants and Sweden. Well, this morning on Fox & Friends, Tucker spoke about the interview and the president's comments. Presidents ought to be precise in what they say. There should be no question about what their meaning is, and that applies to this president, too, for sure. On the other hand, it seems like we may be missing the point of the story, which is there has been a massive social cost associated with the refugee policies and the immigration policies of Western Europe. Here now is Matt Bennett, former deputy assistant to President Clinton, Dana Lash, host of Dana on the Blaze TV, and Guy Benson, political editor at townhall.com and a Fox News contributor. I'm sure there's a very spirited discussion about to happen here because there are so many ways to look at this and what has happened. But Guy, one thing is for sure, the White House immediately came out and clarified the president was not referencing an attack that had happened the night before in Sweden. He was referencing crime in general in Sweden. He has not calmed his critics, however. Your response? Yeah. All right, so there's a couple moving parts here, Sandra, and I think we just heard that explanation from Tucker on Fox and Friends this morning. That was a really good one. Yes, President Trump was quite imprecise with his words, and when you're the president, words matter, facts matter, phrasing matters, and that's something that maybe the president can improve upon, let's put it that way. But what was the reaction among so many in the press? It was to invent a story that Trump's words were in reference to some sort of fake non-existent terrorist attack, which is something that he never said. They inferred it, perhaps, but it seems like there's a problem here on both sides where Trump doesn't quite get it right, uh, to put it mildly, on the details, and then the press reads something into it that he never said, and they run with it, and that's not accurate either. So I can imagine a lot of voters sitting back and saying, I don't know who to trust because it seems like a lot of people are behaving irresponsibly. I mean, Matt, it, it does seem that they, they're not giving him any room here. Everything he, d he said, um, it seems this, the press wants to ignore the point that he's making. Tucker Carlson made the very point. We're not getting to the real issue here. He is actually raising a very important point, uh, one that is Sweden. And it's open borders. And is there anything that we can learn from the immigration policy that we've seen in other parts of Europe? Well, that point was not at all clear from what the president said at that rally. But, but look, the bigger problem, Sandra, is that he says things that are obviously and provably false all the time. So you have the press kind of chasing Stick him around. Stick with this statement, though. These... What did he say that was false here? Well, look, nothing in, his, in this exact sentence was false, and I'm, I'm not suggesting that it was. But one thing that is kind of disturbing the president apparently is not a big fan of his intelligence briefings. He, he was tweeting about Nordstrom 20 minutes into one of the briefings last week. He should not be getting news about but, but Europe we're, we're from Fox News. We're getting off subject here because there's obviously no, a problem that he's trying uh, to bring up. Guy, mm. I see you nodding your head. Let's talk mm -hmm. about Sweden and the prom problem that's there. Yes, Dana, jump let's. in here as well. Hundreds of thousands of ref refugees and asylum, asylum seekers in just the last few years. Top right. three countries of origin, Syria, Afghanistan, and Iraq. Even one of their own people in Sweden, uh, one of their own researchers, I found this in a, in a Swedish newspaper, warning that segregation and long-term unemployment of refugees could have a negative effect on crime rates in Sweden in the future. Why yeah. is nobody willing to discuss what is happening and what very quickly could be happening in some of these parts of the world? You're absolutely right, Sandra. There's been an increase in no-go zones. I mean, Horowitz was discussing this. There's also, we've heard from uh, a number of individuals who work with police in Sweden. They say that they're at a breaking point where it concerns crime. Look, it's irrelevant whether or not Trump's words were imprecise. I do agree with Guy that, that words matter. However, this is what the left does. They, they say, well, because Trump was imprecise with his arguments, I, with his statements, and there was no incident in Sweden last night. I guess there's no problem in Sweden. Guess they're not having an epidemic of rapes. Guess they're not having an epidemic in all of Europe with terror attacks right now because there is an influx of unvetted refugees. That is the problem. You can simultaneously, and I feel like I have to draw a picture for our brethren across the aisle to fully understand this, Sandra. There, you can simultaneously say, maybe he didn't say it perfectly the way that they would like, but also there is a serious problem going on in Sweden with refugees refugee and crimes, and that's the reason the whole phrase refugee came to exist. You can do both. Yeah, uh, and, and Matt, I want to get your reaction to that, but Guy, first I want to talk about this new EO, uh, this new executive order that could be coming down any moment. We know 
some of the details that have been reported is that this targets the same seven predominantly Muslim countries as the first order. But there are some changes to it. Is this draft going to see the same sort of resistance as the last one? This is the draft, if the reporting is accurate, this is the order that should have been put out initially. It cleaned up a lot of the PR and policy messes that the first one created. Those were unforced errors. And I know a lot of people want to focus on those seven countries. Those were pre-existing from a list that predated President Trump based on existing legislation. So I actually have read a fair amount of legal analysis that convinces me that the lower courts throwing out the initial order, even though I had problems with it, uh, was bad law because the president has a lot of power under the Constitution and under statute on these matters. But now that they are honing this and fine-tuning it more carefully, which they should have done before they rolled it out uh, initially, I think that it absolutely should pass constitutional muster and I think is overall just better policy. So Matt, let me, let me bring this all full cir circle here and let's look at what is happening over there. In your view, is there anything that we can learn from the immigration poly policy we have seen in Europe and the fallout there. Is there anything that we can learn from that and apply here? Well, of course there is, and we've learned that lesson. Europe is physically attached to these war zones where the refugees are coming from, and they were coming uh, either by boat or on foot, and uh, they have hundreds of thousands of refugees flowing in without any sort of uh, vetting or checking. By contrast, and this is contrary to what the president keeps saying, we have intense vetting of refugees, say, from, from Syria. It takes almost two years for a refugee to get into the country. This is totally unlike what's going on in Europe. And anyone who wants to draw uh, comparisons between the two has to explain that this is an utterly different situation. All right, Dana, last word to you. Well, I, I think that as, as what Guy said, those seven countries, those, those were drawn up in a list by former President Barack Obama. And I think it's smart to be able to slow down the process and be able to adequately vet who's coming into the country. An additional 90 days on top of 120 days does not a huge difference make. And I'm glad to see that something's finally being done and that people are starting to take this issue seriously. We don't want to end up like Europe. And this is a good first step. Mm. All right. Uh, Guy, Dana, Matt, thanks to all three of you for being Thank here. You, Sandra. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you, Sandra. All right, well, still ahead, an outspoken critic of President Trump's immigration policies is now facing some heat over a crime wave in his city. We'll debate when David Wool and Richard Fowler are here with us next. Plus, controversial provocateur Milo Yiannopoulos disinvited from CPAC today. We'll talk to the man who first invited and then kicked out the Breitbart editor. Matt Schlapp, the chairman of the conference, explains. Developing tonight, recent raids against undocumented immigrants resulting in some unexpected consequences for the U.S. agricultural industry. Steve Harrigan has the details from Jacksonville, Florida, where the first 100 days will be holding an immigration town hall tomorrow evening. Hi. Sandra, food growers here say it is the worst feeling imaginable when you see your crops out in the field rotting because you don't have the labor to bring them in. It could happen to many here this season. In, we will have strong borders again. President Trump's immigration policy has divided Florida, pitting supporters in the north and central part of the state who back his call for tough border control. We do respect the people that are here, but my ancestors came over here legally and they came over and they did went through the right procedures to be in this great country, and we welcome everybody. We are the capital of immigrants in Miami-Dade County. Against parts of southern Florida, where the immigrant population is among the highest in the country. This executive order, this presidential order that came down, uh, represents exactly the contrary, represents fear, represents prosecution, represents hate, and is anti-immigrant. But any crackdown against illegal migrants could have unintended consequences for a key segment of the state's economy. One quarter of Paul DeMar's tomato crop could be left to rot in the field this season. We haven't got any labor, which is really bad, so we can't pick the crops. And there's nothing worse than growing a crop and not being able to pick it. Row crops like tomatoes and peppers require pickers to stoop all day in the heat. Yeah. Back-breaking labor traditionally performed by seasonal Mexican farm workers, more than half undocumented. It is piecework per bucket. A skilled picker can earn $150 a day. Any increase in deportations could shrink that labor force even further, 
forcing some, like DeMar, whose family has grown tomatoes for 90 years, out of business entirely. And preparations here underway for a big town hall on immigration, 7 p.m. tomorrow night, hosted by Martha McCallum. Sandra, back to you. All right, Steve Harrigan, thank you. Also developing tonight, an outspoken critic of President Trump's immigration policies, Los Angeles Mayor Eric Garcetti, facing criticism of his own for ignoring crime data ahead of his run for re-election. L.A. Daily News drawing attention under the headline, quote, L.A. Mayor Eric Garcetti accused of being silent on cities rising crime. Joining me now is David Wool. He is an attorney and Trump supporter, and Richard Fowler is a nationally syndicated radio show host and Fox News contributor. Uh, David, when you consider what is going on in the state of California and now to have the mayor of Los Angeles basically hiding the rising crime rate there, this doesn't do the citizens any favors. No, I mean, you know, last year, 2016, crime was up, violent crime was up 10% over 2015. Today, in a neighboring city, Whittier, a cop was killed by a violent felon. Yesterday, sources tell me that a, the sister of an LAPD officer was killed by an illegal alien who had been deported numerous times. It's bad news. I mean, Garcetti doesn't want to talk about it. The election is two weeks from tomorrow. Surprise. Look, he and Chief Charlie Beck have turned this city into a full service sanctuary city, including setting up a $10 million fund for illegal immigrants to access if they get deported to fight the deportation. That despite